Check, check, check. Let's see if we're actually getting audio here. Check, any check, 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 check. Yep, looks good. All righty then. I'm having some little bits of trouble with restream, but pretty much pretty good. Hey, whoever's here from Facebook, YouTube, what are you from? from? All right, so let me get this started. All right, today I have, well, welcome to Evidence Based Audio number 224. And today we're talking about microphones. This is, um, this is something we talk about all the time, all these magical claims made about electronic devices as if we don't understand them as if only in the 1950s could something be built correctly whatever um this is jim lill jim lill has done a series of videos let's uh let's pull up his channel here uh one of the most controversial ones was when he uh checked uh, where does the tone come from in an electric guitar and you know he he basically broke every part of a guitar down and showed that Tonewood was nonsense. Um, you know, all this stuff is nonsense. And he's, he's actually tested this stuff in amazing ways. He's got a really cool workshop, and he, like, built his own speaker cabinets to prove this. He, he tested scale length. All sorts of myths that musicians fall into all the time. But not so much the stuff that I talk about where it's the myths that audio engineers fall into, producers... Uh, magazines like to push salesmen like to push and, and you guys know my my main one is microphone preamps right mic preamps we know how to make a flat mic preamp we know how to make a mic preamp that's quiet enough to get into the digital world at the limits of our capture technology we know how to make mic preamps that don't distort we know how to make this stuff there's this claim out there that only these magical things are made in the 50s or 60s could actually work or, or you know, you got to pay $5,000 a channel for them or whatever. It's absolute nonsense. You may want to make a mic preamp that, that changes your sound, same as people like guitar amps that change their sound. But the claim that you can't make a transparent mic preamp today is absolute nonsense. Uh, and I'm hoping Jim will tackle that one of these days, but right now he's doing microphones, which, again, is another one where people make insane claims about, like, we, we don't know how to make good mics. What was it last week or whatever? I was, I was showing a video of taking like a $50 or $20 or something Amazon mic. Fake U87. Sounded great, man. Uh, you know, who knows? It'll probably break. Uh, the, the threads were plastic, but sounded fine. All right. So anyway, let's, let's take a look and uh, move on here. It's August 6, 2023. And today I get to figure out what all these mics sound like. My name is Jim. I'm a musician in Nashville, and I tend to be around a lot of microphones, but I don't actually know anything about them. I do know there are some mics that cool studios have that were used on cool records, and if I wanted to get one, it'd be like... Yeah, look at the price, like 30 grand for these uh, U47s and C12s and Telefunkens. I mean, we had all this stuff at Vintage, and, you know, honestly... Yeah, here goes all my credibility. They didn't do anything magical. They did the same stuff as any other microphone does. They might sound a little bit different. They might act a little bit different. But, you know, honestly, if you can't get a good sound out of a decent microphone, you're screwed anyway. Like $30,000. And I want to know, what am I missing out on if I only have mics that cost hundreds of dollars or even tens of dollars? I've made videos trying to figure out where the tone comes from in guitars and amps and cabs or some other. Yeah, you know, he, he actually made a, made a guitar by putting a set of tuners on one table and a bridge on another table and some pickups in between it sounded exactly like any other guitar of that type and build so uh this guy this guy does the actual work and brings the receipts other fun stuff in between and now my mission is to figure out where the tone comes from in a microphone but what does it actually take to create a fair comparison between microphones i can't just sing and play into the mics back to back because that's not the same performance I can't just sing and play into the mic side by side because they're not in the same spot. I can't just use a guitar cab because it doesn't cover the whole hearing range. And I can't just use a studio monitor because the bass and the treble won't be coming from the same angle. 
What I can do is take this old crate combo cab, cut scrap wood to fill the gaps, cut a hole in it, and drop in a thing that's a little treble speaker in the middle of a bigger bass speaker. Yeah, this is just like our FRFR that I've been building lately from uh, Celestion, right? The F12 X200. It's got a concentric monitor. Uh, if you are getting into full range flat response, Behringer, I think, has a company called Turbo Sound that has a um, concentric monitor. It's actually really popular in the, in the live sound industry right now, but I'm betting, and I've seen reports that it's a great FRFR speaker. Um, I've built, or I've had somebody, my friend, build um, some cabinets for these Celestion ones. I'm still not super convinced on them uh, compared to a regular PA speaker, but this is, this is the way to go. I mean, if you're going to have to do a full range, there's actually a good idea here. And now I had a thing that could play enough of the whole hearing range the same way every time into every mic. And that should make for great comparisons. If I can make sure the mics are actually all in the same position, which is embarrassingly difficult to get right over yep. and over. How about yep. it? Where's the capsule? Where's the grill? You know? Picture frame. If I put it on a pair of skis that hug the sides of the test cab, then take some fishing line and make a target, then that guarantees every mic is going to end up... Yeah, this guy is so good about how he does his experiments. I'm like... When he did his guitar tone wood experiments, it took major God of the Gap special pleading for anybody to even stay in this uh, in this nonsense. But um, you know, honestly, people still are. So you know, you 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 can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him think. Is that the thing? In the exact same spot, left to right, up to down, and front to back. This is my homemade precision mic testing rig. Corey, check it out. I made a custom mic testing rig. Cool. So this lives in the kitchen now? The amount of work it took just to get this far made me realize that actual fair comparisons between microphones must be incredibly rare because I've never met anyone else who's done this. Yeah, and that's the thing. So whenever, yeah, you guys who are mad at me on the forums and stuff, because I always ask, hey, when somebody says, hey, this, uh, pickup or this microphone preamp is way warmer. I'm, I always ask, what units are you measuring warm in? You know, what were the test conditions? And they'll always run away. If you ask people for evidence, if they're selling snake oil, they're going to run away or they're going to attack you. That's, that's the even better one. When they go on attack, because you're just asking, Hey, you know, you made a claim, you back it up. So what microphone should I test? Well, my favorite music was recorded with the mics at studios like Station West and Ocean Way Nashville, so I wish I could test those, but I should probably start with the mics that are already in my house. When I was a kid, I started liking the sound of country music, but most people my age didn't, so if I was going to record a song that sounded like I wanted, I had to learn how to do a lot of it myself. I don't spend money on beer or restaurants, and I drive the same car I had in high school, so once in a while when I had extra gig money, instead of that stuff, I'd buy a microphone for vocals, or my guitar cab, or my pedal steel amp, or acoustic guitar, or inside the kick drum, or outside the kick drum, or the snares, the toms, the hi-hat, and the overheads. So these are my microphones, and I needed some audio to blast out of my testing rig into each mic, so I created some audio. I played and recorded all of those instruments to make a full range, full band loop, and chopped it down so the comparisons could be quick and identical. Now let's answer some questions. Do different mics sound different? Yes. Okay, so you guys had noticed the um let me, let me pull this back. So in that 421, you, you might you might notice, you know, I mean you do hear differences in these mics. Um for the most part, nothing that you couldn't EQ your way out of. I know, I know, I know, I know that's blasphemy. I mean, as, as long as you got the polar pattern you need, because you know, like if you're picking up an omni and or you know, you may not be getting your proximity effect, whatever. But in general, it's going to be pretty close, but I mean, when you hear the super hard cardioid, hypercardioid wheeze, man, that is, that is something people don't think about because you're not, you're not comparing the same mic in the same spot to other mics. But if you've done this a lot, you, you're going to listen to what happens when the 421 comes in. Listen to that. Let me give back to the 421. Sorry, I, I know I'm obsessing here. Yeah. 
And if you think that's goofy, man, mic something with a shotgun that wasn't meant to be mic'd with a shotgun. Hey, do you know home studio? All right, different mics do actually sound different. It's really special to be able to hear their differences side by side, but I can also play a sweep test from the rig into each mic and the computer can make a graph out of it, which by itself isn't that useful, but if I put two or more mics on the screen, it can show exactly how different they are from each other. I just have to pick a holy grail mic to be the flat line on the graph that everything 57. else gets compared to. 57, everybody's got a 57, use the 57. I know, I know it's blasphemy. I know it's got slow transient response. It's not a condenser. But just pick the 57. We all know what a 57 sounds like. But which one is the holy grail? The instinct is to want to compare things to the most perfect possible mic. That's what the microphone companies do when they come up with the squiggles in their manual. All right. If you guys don't know, this curve right here is absolute, total, complete nonsense. That is... I guarantee that thing is smoothed. There's no way it is anywhere near that that smooth. Uh, and, you know, Harvey Gersh talked about this a lot in microphone smoothing, um, polar pattern normalization. Like, you got to know how to read a mic chart because they are, for the most part, complete nonsense. That I mean, you can tell is absolute nonsense. You, you don't have to be an expert to know that that. It was definitely not what that mic sounds like. The idea is that they're comparing their mics to something that sounds so neutral, it's as if a microphone isn't even there. But when I'm trying to record something, I'm never choosing between no microphone and a microphone. I'm choosing between whatever microphones are in the building. So I'm going to make the first useful mic comparison graphs ever by saying something that nobody else has ever said. This is an SM57. <laughs> this yes. Thank you, Jim. That is, I mean, honestly, it it's not cheap there that 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 uh, fake u87 i got from amazon is cheaper than this but um 57s are everywhere you can get one i i, I don't like to use them because i i know that mechanically they're reliable but mechanically they're also in a way unreliable i don't like the i don't like the grill the grill moves around it makes trouble for me but you know if you come over here i got a bunch of banana uh, 57s where you pop it in half and put a little plumbing uh elbow in there so you can get it on snares and stuff easier i mean there every, everybody can get a 57 so this is a perfectly good mic to test with this is flat everyone in the world will tell you it's not flat and that it has a bump here and a roll off there just look at the squiggles in the manual but culturally this is flat it's 99 dollars new it's been out there for over 50 years it's one of the best selling mics of all time and was still the best selling mic of the year last year every rehearsal every show and every session i've ever played has had a dozen of these laying around this is the sound our ears have heard and our brains have understood as what a microphone sounds like by default. If you play me a chunk of audio that was recorded by an SM57, then play me the same chunk of audio recorded by a different mic, I will now know what the other mic sounds like. It would not be sputtered with gold. That's the mic of a carpenter. You've chosen wisely. And now let's answer some questions. How different does a big tube mic sound from a 57? Was that Raiders of the Lost Ark, but in country style? That's awesome. How different does a tiny pencil condenser sound from a 57? What about a different kind of dynamic mic? Listen to that, man. I tell you, it, it's it's crazy. And this is why it drives me nuts. Like everybody wants me to use 421s on toms. And I know that is the standard or whatever that everybody's always used. I can't stand them. And and it's because of I mean you just hear this crazy whistling nightmare of the symbols behind it. I mean, remember, everybody puts their symbols way the hell too close to the toms. Crappy drummers hit their symbols way harder than their toms. So to me, a 421 has always been just a crappy auxiliary cymbal mic. What about a kick drum mic? How different do 57s sound from each other? There you go. Uh -huh. Okay, so when you guys claim that this blah blah mic is this always better than this other blah blah mic, not only do mics sound different than each other, and that that's getting that's getting less and less now. But if you notice, 
in these pictures, these mics are slightly pointed different than each other. Changing a microphone by a degree changes, I mean, changing the angle by a degree or by, by a quarter of an inch, uh, makes so much more difference than the type of microphone, um, most of the time. So, you know, take this all with a grain of salt. This is all really cool and useful stuff to know that I didn't have any way of knowing before doing this. But I wanted to dig a little deeper and ask the question, why do these different mics sound different? It was at this point that I got an email from the CMA, the Country Music Association, saying they liked my videos and wanted to sponsor what I was doing. And I've always turned down sponsorship offers. I usually just write my PayPal email on something silly I've made. But I used to sit cross-legged on the floor looking up at the CMA Awards show on TV every year and watch the performers sing and play songs I loved. And that kind of thing led to me wanting to move to Nashville and actually try to do this. And I have. So CMA has some new video series on their YouTube channel, including In Their Boots, which follows along and profiles many of the talented people behind the scenes of country music. The High Notes, which sits down with country music icons, up-and-coming artists, stagehands, tour managers, and all the people who make country music what it is to see how they prepare for the day before a career milestone. And Music To My Ears, hosted by singers, songwriters, artists, performers, label executives, producers, and fans as they break down lyrics and reflect on country music throughout the decades. And CMA cares so much about people finding and enjoying the videos they're making that they're paying me a pile of money just to talk about their YouTube channel in my video. They have a pile of money's worth of confidence that the people who like what I do are gonna like what they do. That's pretty committed. And the link to CMA's channel is in this video's description. So now I have a pile of money. I've never had one of these before. <laughs> this opens up a whole world of things I can do. I could finally fix my door handle. Actually, nope, I'll worry about that later because I've heard that tube mics are warm and solid state mics are clear and I have no idea what that means. But yeah, I look at the words, euphoric color, warm, you know, nonsense weasel words every time, right? You know my big gold thing is a tube mic made by Lawson in Nashville and Lawson sells mic bodies without tubes that are also compatible with their capsules. So I bought one. Now if I test the same capsule with a tube circuit versus a solid state circuit, how different do those sound? <laughs> Let me play this back again. Different do those sound? Okay, not only will nobody ever hear the difference in in a finished album, but um, you could easily say that that uh, what is it? One, two, three, four. That less than one dB of difference is um is just placement. It's just angle or it's just distance. I know he's been really careful to get these um as close as he can to to each other, but you're not going to get it perfect. And I mean, it, people think tubes do this magic stuff, and 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 really, in the recording, I don't hear tubes making things warmer, whatever that means. I hear them making it brighter. Like when you when you distort, and, and I'm only talking about when you're not using the stuff in this linear range. In the linear range, tubes and solid state sound like exactly the same. If if they're made right, they're going to be just as flat. You know, uh, tubes might be a little bit noisier. Uh, they might not have as good of a dynamic range, but in general, you can get them just as flat. It's when you distort them, and the tubes add this treble boost. You know, so I don't know, this warm thing has always been crazy. Huh. But what about all? Are you going to write home about that difference? Get out of here. Huh. But what about all the stuff people say about cool, old, well-built American oh, yeah. tubes versus the newer, cheap, poor-quality ones? Well, I've never opened up this mic before, but it looks like it has an RCA6072USA. Is that a cool tube? I looked it up, and yes, that is a cool tube. But I needed something to compare it to, so I pulled a couple random tubes out of the back of my reissue Fender Twin. How different? So do when I worked in the big studios, you know, they told us, do not ever use a random uh, 12AX7 in RC12s or, or anything like that. And you know what? When I learned more about tubes, I felt very silly. Uh, give me one second. Let me make sure we got... Okay, yeah, everything should be open. Perfect.
All right, here we go. So, so he's pulled out an ECC eighty one, which I think is that a twelve A D seven, not a twelve AX seven. ECC eighty three is a twelve AX seven, right? I don't know. Do all these sound from each other? Okay, so I hope nobody's surprised that that different tubes of the same spec don't sound different, all right? This has been a lie that's been sold to us guitar players for decades, and it still is. I mean, most people still believe this nonsense, but okay, there you go. Let me play this again. It's out of the back of my reissue Fender Twin. How different do all these sound from each other? But what about Transformers? Are they giving the mic any extra warmth or punchiness or whatever? I don't know, but I do know that I can test an SM57, open it up, disconnect the transformer, wire it straight to an XLR cable, and test it again. How different would that sound? I think it's important to point out that I've been taking the time to exactly level match everything because in 100% of situations the mic will be going into a mic preamp and the mic preamp will be turned up or down in amount that makes sense and then mixed on faders it will be turned up or down in amount that makes sense. The lowest output mic in the building could be the loudest mic in the mix because the original output level of the mic will be corrected for and made irrelevant twice. The only thing that matters is the tone coming from the microphone. So while things like tubes and transformers can cause the volume of the mic to be lower or higher, once that gets balanced out, the... Oh, isn't this interesting? Look at this, um, asymmetrical. It's 451 versus CV12. Interesting. Now, whether or not you actually hear that is, a, is another thing. The difference in tone is exactly what you just heard. Hey, it surprised me too. Continuing the search, it's not super common, but sometimes a mic does have EQ designed into the circuit, consciously, with the goal of affecting things in the middle of the human hearing range, and one of them is this. So I tested it, opened it up, disconnected the EQ, and tested it again. How different does that sound? So it seems like aside from when there's EQ purposely designed into the circuit, the tone of the mic must be coming from something to do with the capsule and what's physically going on around the capsule. And the circuit just does a pretty good job of shooting everything out through the cable into the preamp. Unless the circuit... Now, again, there are, there are circuits, like he said, with the EQ and stuff, there are circuits that are designed to do things to the tone, so... I'm gonna be careful with this. It just does a pretty good job of shooting everything out through the cable into the preamp. Unless the circuit gets overloaded and distorted. So how do you figure out when that's gonna happen? <laughs> Sorry, <David. laughs> See, this guy, this is why I love this guy, man. He brings the receipts, he's doing this. All these guys just sit there pontificating on forums about this and that, like as if they know anything. They they haven't look, our, our brains are error generating machines. I know I don't don't make me play the McGurk effect video again, but you know, we've we've lived by assuming things that, that aren't there because better when you hear a wind rustling in the grass to think that it's a lion that's gonna eat you and run away than to assume it's not and Turns out it was a lion and it eats you, right? So our brains are error-generating machines. Our, our eyes are not video recorders. Our, our ears are not tape recorders. Uh, we have many ways to be fallible. I waited until I saw the sun. Shotguns and barbed wire fences! Now let's answer some questions. Which mics distort in which scenarios? Ooh. Which one was that? The 451? Oh! <laughs> Say what you will about the lowly 57, man, but it can handle some insane SPL.
barbed wire fences. Shotguns and 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 barbed wire fences. So first thing I noticed was that the dynamic mics never distorted, even in the loudest situations, so I don't have to worry about those. But then it gets more nuanced. The condenser mics distorted on the kick and snare, so the circuit probably matters there. Only two of them distorted on the twin crank to 10, so it's possible that in some scenarios the circuit matters there. And for overheads and vocals, only one of them, the cheap over bias tube mic, distorted. So it Now, are we sure this is capsule distortion and not circuit distortion? I'm sure he's taking account for, for mic preamp distortion, but um, the onboard circuit could be distorting. You know, could the transformer be distorting? I don't know. It's actually not likely that circuit would matter there in most cases, even with a condenser mic. And then for acoustic, none of the mics distorted, even though I reamed on a bourgeois banjo killer, named for its loudness, with the mic right up on the body, closer than an acoustic mic would usually be placed. And there's something very exciting that I can do with this info. I happen to have first-hand evidence that one of the mics used to record my favorite acoustic guitar sounds was a Telefunken 251 at Ocean Way, Nashville, which is a $25,000 vintage tube microphone. But since it was used on acoustic guitar and that mic doesn't have any EQ in the circuit, I'm not hearing the circuit. I'm just hearing a clean signal from the capsule. So theoretically, I wouldn't need a $25,000 vintage tube mic to get that sound. I'd just need basically any mic body with a capsule that... Now, it was, I think it was just last week's episode or last episode, maybe it wasn't last week, where we were talking about, um, you know, yes, these are holes drilled in a mic and um, they do make a delay network. In some cases, there's, 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 there's things that, that the capsule construction um, affects, but it's not stuff we don't understand today. It's stuff we can do better today, not worse better and um one of the things they were talking about is you know mic modeling by you know using an impulse to flatten out or to to turn one microphone sound into another and there there are things that are different you know polar patterns being one of them um these delay networks possibly being one of them so it's it's not that we can necessarily get exactly the same sound out of different mics but you know, like Stephen Slate's VM1 or whatever the mic, uh, mic modeling thing um, works pretty well. That has a similar frequency response. And I didn't have any way of knowing what the frequency response of Oceanway's Telefunken 251 is, but when I looked up what kind of capsule it would have, this guy had said it's this kind, and I wanted one. When I searched the internet for microphone parts, I ended up at microphoneparts.com and I could get a kit with a simple circuit in that style capsule for under $400. And I'm just a performer, I don't know anything about building microphones, but... Happy learned how to putt. Uh-oh! <laughs> Wait, was that from an Adam Sandler movie? Is that Happy Gilmore? Awesome. Yeah, I love these guys' stuff. So if, if somebody really wants a certain type of mic, these guys... You can go to mic parts. I think there's a couple other places like this, and you can just build whatever dream mic you ever wanted. You know, I, I would stay away from the tube stuff, honestly. It's not like you just heard, it's not going to do anything magic for you anyway. Now let's answer some questions. First, two mics, same capsule, different circuit. How different do they sound? Second, two mics, different capsule, same circuit. How different do they sound? All right, but these mics do have different grills. I know grills on dynamic mics with foam in them can affect the sound. But I didn't know how much the foamless again, you know, it's hard because you, you can see that these angles are changed, aren't they? Watch, watch the watch the angle closely. But I'm telling you, a degree of angle difference makes so crazy much difference to the to the tone here. No, let's see. Let's see. Is that oh yeah, there there I am. I don't know anybody wants to see this 
ugly face here. I know, I'm getting washed out by this light. Sorry about that. But I didn't know how much the foamless grills on a condenser mic changed the sound, so I tested a ton of things. All right, so it seems like as long as you're pointing the mic at the thing you want to hear and the grill isn't literally blocking sound from getting to the capsule, which none of the condenser grills look like they're doing, then the sound just goes right through. That pretty much just leaves the capsule making the mic sound like it does. But I've heard that cool vintage mics, even with the same type of capsule, can sound different from each other, meaning the capsules either changed over time or weren't. Yes, the capsule has changed over time. The electronics have degraded. Uh, there, there's so many things that that could change it and, and this is why these guys claim they like they can hear okay first of all how many times have you guys seen when i offer a challenge you know either for a certain amount of money or some gear or whatever uh to people who claim they can pick out which microphone is which or which mic preamp is which they always run away nobody will ever put their money up on a test like this because they're full of crap but they, they always make it like this this one type of microphone this brand is magic and then yet the different examples of them sound so different it, it's incredible we don't they didn't have the kind of quality control back then as we do now made the exact same in the first place and this might be my last hurdle so i wanted to figure out what changes the sound in a capsule oh, and man. after successfully building four microphones with no prior experience i rode that wave of confidence and started messing with them making sure i didn't do the thing where the screwdriver slips and destroys the diaphragm yep hey Ouch. i did the thing Ouch. Look, I did the thing. This video is really making me want to buy some mics from mic parts and, and just have a bunch of different capsules out there. Where the thing slips and then it breaks the diaphragm. That's crazy. <laughs> but then I realized something. You know what? Actually, how big a deal is this? How different does this sound? Extremely interesting. The broken diaphragm didn't wreck the mic. The mic still worked, and it didn't even sound that different. But two things were very clear to me. I wanted to know what affects the sound of a condenser capsule so I can understand where the sound comes from in those cool $30,000 vintage mics that were used during the making of my favorite records, and I don't have the knowledge, skills, or equipment to do it myself. But this guy does. This is Preston White. He lives in Nashville, and he builds and repairs vintage mics for my favorite studios. So, how does a mic capsule work? So this is a condenser mic capsule. It's a little oh, wow, smaller than a awesome. double-stuffed Oreo cookie. It has a metal backplate with holes in it, then a very thin air gap created by one of these spacers. On top of that, a very thin plastic diaphragm with a microscopic layer of gold on top of it. And finally, a ring with screws that holds it all together. And usually, it's the same on the other side. When sound hits the diaphragm, the diaphragm moves back and forth and the backplate stays steady, which turns into an electrical signal in the wires, which then goes through the circuit of the mic, out the cable to the preamp. Okay, so if you don't know, that's why they call these capacitor microphones, right? That you're, you're varying the um, capacitance by the diaphragm rather than varying the um, electric current into an electrical signal in the wires, which then goes through the circuit of the mic, out the cable to the preamp. And what things might change the sound of it? Isn't that funny? So, like, the here's the guy who builds all the mics, all the cultists drool over and, and issue their religious proclamations about, and he's running it into the Focusrite mic preamp that everybody seems to hate. There you go. Capsule. Things like the size of the air gaps, the diaphragm thickness, the diaphragm tensioning, the amount of gold sputtered on the diaphragm, how the back plate is drilled. Has anyone ever tested those things? Not that I'm aware of. Can I pay exactly. you to make so all this stuff, all the things the lore and religion are created around, and nobody actually knows what the hell any of it does. Like, I mean, none of the guys claiming this crap. Uh, most of us build this stuff this way because this is just the way it's always been built. It's crazy how little people care whether or not their beliefs are true. A bunch of slightly different diaphragms so we can figure out how much each of those things affects the sound? Sure. Now let's answer some questions. Can the sound change if the polarizing voltage is different? 
What about diaphragm tension? What about the number of screws in the ring? What about gold thickness? What about mylar thickness? Oh, wow. Okay, so everybody... Conventional wisdom is that the thinner the diaphragm, the higher frequencies it's going to pick up. Let's, let's, let's listen to this. What about mylar thickness? Wow. What about the spacers? <sighs> this little Oreo is not simple. I stared at these graphs for three days and some things still didn't make sense, but I was able to find one big trend. Each thing we tested contributes in some way to the capsule's total capacitance. And that's a big word I barely understand, but when I lined everything up in order from lowest to highest, this happened. So regardless of every other individual difference, as the capacitance goes up, a wide dip in the low mids gets bigger, a narrow peak in the upper mids gets bigger, and a dip in the high treble gets bigger. All right, so are we making an RC circuit right here? Is that what's going on? Like, I mean, why is it that this guy is the guy who's finally putting the, uh, with the screws to everything? All you guys making all these claims all the time. You should, this was your job for decades. Before this guy was even born, you guys were spouting this nonsense. And here he comes to clean it up. And remember, this was all done with the same capsule, just tweaking small things about it. I was happy to know more about how that stuff actually works, but also a little bummed out because it shows that even if I bought the same model of microphone as my heroes used to make my favorite music, there's no way for me to know if I'm actually getting the same kind of sound. The only way for me to know what real studio mics actually sound like would be to walk through the front door of the studio where that music was recorded with my big silly rig and test the actual individual mics themselves. This is Station West Studios in Berry Hill. My favorite music was overdubbed and mixed here, and I spent a day in Studio A with my testing rig and access to all of their microphones. Oh, wow. Now let's answer some questions. Sometimes sessions at Station West will have a Cascade Fathead ribbon mic oh, yeah, alongside a, ribbon. a 57 on guitar cabs, so how different do they sound? Wow. Sometimes a Yamaha subkick gets used on Kick Out. What does that sound like? I usually see 421s on all the toms, but at Station West, they use an Audix D2 on the high tom. How yes. different are those mics? The SM7B is a pretty common vocal mic, so what does it sound like? And it also has really low output, so some companies make an accessory that's supposed to make the mic louder and the tone better. And these definitely. Okay, so we've tested all these, right? We don't got to go back over this. Definitely make it louder, but if the loudness is matched, how different does the tone sound? What if I take that big foam windscreen off? I've seen Lewitt mics make their way into the consciousness of Nashville engineers more lately, and the thing I've heard about is how they have both tube and FET circuits, and you can choose one or the other or blend them, so you can supposedly get the best of both tones. And tests I've done so far makes me question, how different does a Lewitt mic sound on tube mode versus FET mode? Now, hold on. If you're trying to sell something, you could definitely make your circuits a little bit different so that you're, um, you're going to have, it will make a difference to you. So it won't ne not necessarily be anything useful. Hey, Herschel. Uh, yeah, I mean, this guy puts out serious, he brings the receipts, man. I, I love this guy. It, it just kills me. But it's funny, if you go over to like Safe Space or whatever, the guys are still defending them all their claims about all this, you know, tone wood on guitars or whatever. Our makes me question, how different does a Lewitt mic sound on tube mode versus FET mode? <laughs> okay, yeah, that's kind of what I expected. Wow. And Station West has five... At least they're honest. At least Lewitt was honest. They didn't try and pull something nasty. So, back when James Randi was still alive and the JRF was still going, um... 
there was a company that was making speaker cables for like sixty thousand dollars, and they and they were claiming that he could pick his cables out every single time in a test. And and the the J Ref, you know, I, I don't know if you know, they they have a million dollar challenge that um basically if you can prove any of your claims of paranormal or supernatural, whatever, you get a million bucks. And and they okayed the speaker cable test. And I was like, wait a second. Um, it would be trivially easy for me to do something to a speaker cable where you could tell the difference between two speaker cables. In fact, just break one of them. One makes sound and one doesn't, you know. So we had to make sure that that these were both working speaker cables first, you know. But um, it would have been easy enough for Lewitt to do something goofy to the to the tube to, like, distort it or something so that it would have a different sound right there. But really, they just, I guess they just left people to their own devices. It's it's all, man, I mean, this is such Kool-Aid, you know? AKG solid tube microphones. That's a budget model from the late 90s that very few people seem to care about, but one of them, the one labeled DB, was actually the lead vocal mic on my favorite music. So how do the five solid tubes sound compared to each other? Without going to these crazy lengths, I never... If, if you look at the scale, so each one of these thin lines is a dB. These are different. They're different by more than a decibel. But, again, man, it's not that much. But, you know, how, how many times have we shown mic preamps that were absolutely flat? I mean, flat to, like, 0.1 of a dB and, and all the... All, all, all the pew potatoes are sitting there saying how different they still were, you know? Yeah, I would say that, um, yeah, Herschel. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, if um, you know, when you take the mic out of its linear range, uh, they are going to act different. Um, you know, it's funny that you can get tubes and, and solid-state stuff to pretty much distort the same, but I would expect that they're not going to, but... By the time you distort one of these circuits, I think you're probably going to distort the capsule um, more than the than the actual onboard mic preamp. Usually, it, 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 earlier in this video, he did where he was actually dis distorting these things on purpose, and I'm betting it, it was the capsule that couldn't handle rather than the electronics. Without going to these crazy lengths, I never would have had a way to know this, but out of all five, DB had the most unique sound, with less bass than the others. It was really cool to get to learn more I about one of broken. the actual mics that made such an impact on my life. But some questions were still there in my head, unanswered. What about all those mythical, unattainable museum pieces that all the cool yeah, engineers seem to cherish and use on major records, like vintage Neumanns and Telefunkens and AKGs from the 1940s and 50s and 60s and 70s? So we had all this stuff at Vintage, you know, and, and like, again, you were playing with fire not to use one of these mics because that's what the artist expected. That's what the producer expected and everything else. But when when I used to test these things before my deconversion, um, when I used to test these things, I would hear that they sounded exactly the same. Oh, man. I mean, you know, the different mics had slight differences, but there wasn't anything that you couldn't just EQ your way out of. And... um but I had to keep believing because that was the, the religion I was raised in. All the ones that cost tens of thousands of dollars. Well, we had we had a matched quartet of M49s. I remember it was, people would drool over those things. Still didn't know what they sounded like. Let's get started. This is Ocean Way Nashville Studio A on Music Row. This is one of the biggest studios in the world. My favorite music was tracked here, and I got to spend an unbelievable day in Studio A with my big silly test rig and access to all of their microphones. It's August 6, 2023, and today I get to figure out what all these mics sound like. <laughs> now let's answer some questions. Ooh, there's my 77s. Look at that. Uh, down here, there's some RCA 77s. I used to use these on everything uh, back in the day. 
I, I don't have a single ribbon mic today, I don't think. And, and, and you know, honestly, I don't care to. All these mics sound like. <laughs> now. now, these are 77 DXs, I think. We also had one called the 77A, which was this giant. It looks like these 77s, but it was like the size of a football. It was the craziest thing. Rob Halford used to sing through that one whenever he was around, which was weird because nobody else could get any volume out of them whatsoever. It was nuts. Now let's answer some questions. This is every test I did, reference to an SM57 and aligned in the middle at 1K. I'm not much of an adjectives guy. When talking about tone, I usually don't get anything out of someone saying a piece of gear sounds rubbery or creamy or whatever, but there are four words that actually can be used to describe how something sounds, and that's brighter, darker, fatter, and thinner. Pretty simple. And anything more specific than that doesn't have words and requires actual <laughs> numbers to be called out. That, that's, that's not too bad, actually. Out. So let's chip away at the things that sound the most different from a 57, starting with the darkest and fattest mics, which includes the Royer ribbons, the vintage ribbons, and the NS10 speaker wired backwards. Then the thinnest mics are the omnidirectional ones and a couple old dynamic mics that were broken. <laughs> Then some of the most different sounding mics are the kick drum mics. There were a couple weird old ones, but these are the two I've seen most. And yeah, these are, again, these have EQ circuits in them very often. Different sounding mics are the kick drum mics. There were a couple weird old ones, but these are the two I've seen most, and turns out their bass and treble peaks are in different spots. Where's the D6? With those gone, the brightest mics left in the upper mids are the old and new versions of the Sennheiser MD-421s, which I learned do actually sound different from each other. The brightest mics in the high treble are the small diaphragm condensers, or pencil condensers. Now, some now remember, he's referencing this to a 57. So this crazy looking scoop at the end, this isn't the mic um, doing something really nuts. This is, in fact, looking at the dip, I can't see my finger here. Um, looking at the dip over here, this is where the peak is on a, on a 57. So a flatter mic is actually going to have a dip right here on this graph. And... Um, this crazy boost you see up here near near the Nyquist frequency, um, that is the fact that 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 fifty seven just doesn't go that high. So everything's going to look like a, a weird scoop. But um, let me find one. Let me, hold on. Now some of the crazy expensive vintage ones. Okay, sorry, let me do this again. Pencil condensers. Okay, so here's a 451. This is a pretty flattish mic. Um, I wish there's like an Earthworks measurement mic in here, but but this is what flat is going to look like. You're gonna you're gonna pull that that dip over here uh, because the the 57 has a kind of a presence peak, and um, like I said, that 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 high frequency roll off, it's it's going to look funny in here. So don't don't think that these mics are super weird. And, and another thing, um, I know people are always wondering, you know, why, why, why small diaphragm condensers, why large diaphragm condensers? The, the small diaphragm condenser is capable of having a, um, the, the, this is way too simplistic, but the flattest frequency response, um, whereas the, the larger diaphragm you get, the more sensitive you can make it, um, so you could have a better signal to noise ratio. So that's... Basically, that, that's the two extremes you're going at. Now some of the crazy expensive vintage ones. The Neumann 47s and 49s were fairly consistent. But the Neumann 67s and 87s were all over the place. As were the AKGs and Telefunkens. Yeah, and this is why, you know, when these people claim that they, they know this mic sound, that mic sound. They sound so different than each other if, if they're ancient. You know, the capsules could be fried by then.
There was so much variance here, it's hard to define a sound for any of them, but it does look like the AKGs tend to be a little brighter than the Neumanns up here. Then there were the SM7s with and without foam. And the Sennheiser 441. Then the Sony C800G. And the working Electro Voice RE20s. And then the rest are all 57s. I never knew what any of those mics actually sounded like, and it feels really good to have a grasp on what they'll do if I pick one of them. But now the real reason I did all this. My favorite music was tracked at Ocean Way and then overdubbed at Station West. The signal chain for JT, I mean, it was literally a 57 into the Neve. That was it. I love when you get a chance to see what really matters. What really matters, write yourself a good song, learn how to play it. <laughs> Don't bother with this religious nonsense about microphones and mic preamps and magical tone wood crap. If I'm gonna care at all about how my microphones sound, then I guess I'd like them to sound like these. So how close am I? <laughs> yeah okay so the 421 is different um i don't know what what's better or what's worse i don't think there is one but um they are different <laughs> All right, let's let's do this again. All right, okay, because this is this is where people just lose their minds, man. <laughs> so you know, last time we were talking about mic modeling or whatever, reading that article. Um, this is why it gets so crazy close. Oh, I'm pretty happy with where I am when it comes to mics. I was really surprised about how <laughs> something like this homemade blue and silver mic could sound so similar to one of Oceanway's $25,000 vintage Telefunk and tube mics. So to take my microphone journey to the absolute extreme, leaving nothing left on the table, I did one more test. This is the pop can. I bought it at a grocery store. I took it out of its packaging, opened it, drank what was inside, then drilled holes in the top and bottom and made a grill out of hot glue and a window screen. <laughs> then I went on Nashville Craigslist, searched the word microphone, and bought the cheapest condenser mic available, getting something that is the most mass-produced, most corner-cutting thing imaginable. I took it apart, used its circuit, and replaced its capsule with a Mic Parts RK12 like my blue and silver had. <laughs> Everything up to this point had been helped significantly by the pile of money given to me by CMA for talking about their YouTube channel. And now the pop can is sponsored by my PayPal email address. I'm happy. I don't know if you guys remember when I did the experiment with the um the old microphones and um we put tool dip inside the uh mic body and <laughs> it actually changed the sound quite a bit. And it really was just the fluting resonance of the mic body getting carried into the capsule and messing it up. And uh, I wonder if this this soda can would do the same thing.
I'm having so much fun figuring out how music actually works. And if you like what I'm doing and want me to keep going, send me a couple bucks and I'll fix my door handle and continue making videos. So, in this final microphone comparison, any differences you hear will be the culmination of all the differences between new versus old, boutique versus mass produced, high quality components versus low quality components, tubes versus no tubes, transformers versus no transformers, a purpose built grill versus a window screen, and a purpose built body versus a pop can. Any similarities you hear will be the frequency response of the capsule. After six intuitive? months of testing microphones and doing things I'd never seen anyone else do, I feel like I have a better idea of what my priority should be every time I plug a microphone into a preamp. Which makes me wonder, where does the tone come from in a mic preamp? Yes! Yes! Oh man, this is that's the dream one. That's what I'm begging him to do for so long because, I mean, we've done this. We've done this test. We've talked about it. You search the older... Older videos on this channel where we test like every mic preamp in the world and found out that, guess what? For the most part, they're flat as a pancake. Um, but, you know, the way Jim does his stuff, I'm sure it'll be better. But, oh, man, that is going to be the ultimate video right there. Hopefully you'll join me in the future for more videos. In fact, if you go to my site, pipelineaudio.net, if it's on right now, we, we had a little crash uh, recently. I had to put stuff back to you let me take a look um so you go to articles real gear measurements mic preamps and hopefully this is working i might have to put these pictures back up yeah so here's all different mic pre's tested take a look people are full of crap uh oh looks like i still got some fixing to do on uh whatever this this nonsense is anyways yeah holy crap um I'm really thinking of going to micparts.com and picking up some mics and uh, let's build some. That'd be a fun thing for the channel, right? Do some of that. Uh, let's let's take a look. Um, what is it, Mike? Mike parts. Mike parts. What we got here? Microphone kits. Ooh. So they sell their own mics. Ooh, they get expensive. Um, the hell is a multi track microphone? Okay, don't care about the tube side of things. So what is the difference? What does this mean, T? Is that transformer? <sighs> what about a 251? Uh, I see the tube one. What's the difference between these two? It's one multi-pattern and one not. Ooh. You got a pattern, multi-pattern. Um, mm -hmm. um, what's the difference in the platinum and the
Oh, wow. You got to pull the mic apart to get to the platinum pattern switch. Okay, so platinum. Uh, um, various upgrades. JFED is a new higher voltage, low noise, uh, better parts, basically. That $100 more. Um, what's the 387? What's the difference here? This is kind of the whole. All right, so let's look at their kits. Don't want tubes. Don't want tubes. Um, what about three? Okay. So we got transformerless J fits. Um, I don't like to have all three of these. <laughs> I don't know. But, okay, multi-pattern, so 47. 47, 414, and 87. Transformer. Okay, let's see. So these are solid state, but are these multi patterned? Uh, cardioid versus Omni, that's it. So these ones are cardioid Omni figure eight. These are the ones I want. Let's see what these cost. Maybe we'll build these. Uh, you guys really want to keep this stuff going? Send me uh, $5 billion <laughs> over PayPal, whatever these things cost. Let's take a look. Oh man, I mean it's not cheap. Almost five hundred bucks for this thing. Um, yeah, these are all around the same price. I, I wouldn't mind them. Um, I'd actually like two of these. Variable EQ. Okay. Anyhow. Um, all right, let's go on. I did have one, another subject I wanted to look at. Um, and this is going to be tank to tech. Wow. I've been going for an hour already. Um, all right. So there is, there's been an announcement from live nation. Can I even say this? I mean, am I going to get banned off of every platform for not enjoying, um, you know, whatever the, the ticket master nonsense, um, there was a announcement that they wouldn't be taking merch fees anymore. But when it comes to, to small bands, especially when they've done a, a tour buy on or whatever, they're getting screwed hard even before the merch fees come in. And um Tank the Tech I haven't seen this yet, but he says, um, I think that's what this is about. It says Live Nation's new program has tricked everyone. So let's let's see what he has to say about this. And you know, Tank just did a video about that Blue Ridge Rock Festival. Whew, that sounded pretty crazy, huh? So let me get back to this. So as I'm sure everybody's all aware, Live Nation is making headlines in the last 48 hours. And for once, it's not horrible stuff. It actually looks like uh, Live Nation has got a big W on their hands for once. Uh, the entire music community is kind of celebrating this. I've seen bands going crazy on Twitter. I've seen fans going crazy. Like, yeah, Live Nation's finally going to take care of the bands. For anybody watching this on YouTube later, uh, we're currently live on Twitch. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, Live Nation has a new, announced a new program called the On The Road Again program, where they are going to eliminate merchandise fees that they take from bands at, I believe it was somewhere around 70 or 80 of their club venues. 
which is about 2000 capacity ish and lower also going to be giving $1,500 to each artist that plays at their shows like $1,500 on top of what they're already getting paid according yeah, to their program no joke. looks great on paper but wait there's more like with any time i see anything with live nation my first gut immediate reaction when i saw this was what's the catch yeah there's a catch there has to be it's live nation live nation isn't doing something like this out of the goodness of their own hearts their pr will make it seem like they are for sure but there's got to be catches in this there's got to be stipulations and in the last 48 hours, I've done my research and I've even talked to friends that I have that work at Live Nation venues, and they have told me there are catches. And today we're going to go over all this. But before we really dive in here, because I feel like this is a topic where people might see my YouTube channel for the first time, uh, if anybody's watching this and be like, oh, you know, what's this guy's background? Why should I listen to what this guy says? Yeah. Uh, for anybody that's new here, I've been... I really like tank to tech stuff. <clears throat> Don't always agree with him, but um, he's got a perspective from a, from a tour performer and... Uh, tour guide or tour sorry a tech a tour, tech on actual real hardcore tours uh he knows what he's talking about um of course he's a beardo so a beardo and the backwards trucker hat so there you go touring in the music industry for 18 years um a few of those years where i was in an actual band playing all over the place including live nation venues but for the majority of it i've been working for bands over the years, I've been a merchandise manager for a couple different companies, uh, one of those being Live Nation merchandise, club bands to arena and stadium bands. I've been a backline tech, so guitars, drums, bass, stuff like that. I've done lighting. I've done a lot of different things. Most recently, I was the North American tour manager for the Electric Callboy tour that was right here. So most of the venues we did on that are venues that are a part of this On the Road Again program. So all these Live Nation venues. So I don't know everything. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually speed this up. Everything, but I do have a good grasp on what goes on in the music industry. So today I want to share some of that knowledge. So to start this off, let's look at the actual official Live Nation announcement. So I'm not like mixing up words or anything. I want to show you exactly what they released a couple days ago. Willie Nelson's On the Road Again inspires new program for developing artists and crew. Live Nation has launched On the Road Again, a new program created with the legendary Willie Nelson <laughs> to support developing artists and the integral teams that support them. Developing artists playing in clubs are the backbone of live music. Almost every artist plays clubs at some point in their career. According to live music charts from Polestar, there are 4,000 venues in the United States and small venues host about 70% of all shows each year. These hardworking artists are impacted the most as tour costs rise and fluctuate. Even as the music industry is experiencing unprecedented growth, Live Nation wants to do more to help the live music careers of these talented artists, as well as the hardworking crews that operate behind the curtain. I don't know what Willie Nelson actually has to do with this, other than just being like the poster child for this program. Obviously, on the road again, they used the title of this of his song, one of his very well-known songs. Was that... Is that Willie Nelson? I mean, that's like an ancient song, right? On the road again. On the road again. Oh, I don't know what he's actually doing. I don't know if this was his initiative. I don't know if he's financially backing anything from it. I think he might just be a, a, a figurehead for this, but... Either way, let's continue. Touring is important to artists, so whatever we can do to help other artists, I think we should do it. This program will impact thousands of artists this year and help make touring a little bit easier, said Willie Nelson, who generously provided his famous hit song, On the Road Again, as the anthem for the program. Okay, so, at least as of right now, he just allowed them to use his song. That's what Willie Nelson did for this. F***ing legend, though. I love me some Willie. Through the end of the year, the On the Road Again program is expected to deliver tens of millions of dollars in extra earnings to club artists and crew by supporting developing artists, all of Live Nation's clubs are investing in developing artists by providing $1,500 in gas and travel cash per show to all headliners and support acts on top of nightly performance compensation. That's, this is surprising because, um, man, I do not want to get canceled over this. And there are so many people who absolutely simp for Live Nation, Ticketmaster, all this stuff. But there are some smaller venues that, that, do use Ticketmaster, or Live Nation, or or whatever Evening Star. I, I don't know who all's involved in that stuff. Is Eventbrite part of this? But there's smaller places that that are that get their tickets from this. Does that mean that they're going to be paying fifteen hundred dollars for a show that's not even going to make fifteen hundred dollars? I don't know. I wonder. I wonder exactly what this means. So the way that that reads right now. 
let's say a band has a, a $1,000 guarantee at a venue, they're still going to get an extra $1,500 on top of that to go into their road expenses. That's really? how that is worded right there. That so that would be unreal. I, 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 I don't believe it, but that would be awesome. Pretty good. Additionally, these clubs will charge no merchandise selling fees, so artists keep 100% of merch profits. Touring is a crucial part of an artist's livelihood, and we understand travel costs take one of the biggest bites out of artists' nightly profits. By helping with these core expenses, we aim to make it easier for artists on the road so they can keep performing to their fans in more cities across the country. The next thing they listed is thanking our behind-the-scenes heroes. Live Nation also wants to recognize all the unsung heroes working behind the scenes night after night to help make these shows happen with more wow. grind and less glory than most of the business. On the Road Again is providing financial bonuses to local promoters that help execute its shows, tour reps that live life on a bus, as well as venue crew members that have worked over go. 500 hours in 2023. The next bullet point is lending a hand to crew across the industry. On the Road Again is donating $5 million to Crew Nation to support crew across the industry facing unforeseen hardships. Now, I will say, for anybody that doesn't know what Crew Nation is, it's actually a great program. Live Nation started Crew Nation to help touring and local crew members if they are experiencing financial hardships. Now, I have actually benefited from this program. When uh, COVID shut down the entire touring industry, Crew Nation actually provided uh, like money, like pay to oh, wow. roadies that couldn't tour anymore. It wasn't a ridiculous amount of money. If I remember off the top of my head, it was like a one-time payment of approximately like $800 or something like that. That's, that's a lot. I, I'm I mean, not complaining. I, I know it that's $800 like it, but... that I didn't have during the pandemic that, uh, yeah. that Crew Nation allowed me to have and not just me but thousands of other people that were touring so crew nation is a great program i will say that delivering for live artists is always our core mission said michael rapineau president and ceo of live nation entertainment the live music industry is continuing to grow and as it does we want to do everything we can to support artists at all levels on their touring journey especially especially the developing artists in clubs like willie says this is all about making it a little easier for thousands of artists to continue doing what they love going out and playing for their fans on the Road Again is a true collaboration that draws on insights from Nelson's years on the road as well as feedback from touring artists, their teams, and venue operators to help support day-to-day -day life on tour. All benefits from On the Road Again are being provided directly from the venue's existing earnings with no increases to customers. Remember that line for later. Wait a second. No. All benefits from On the Road Again are being provided directly from the venue's existing earnings? With no increases to consumers. How how does the venue pay for that? Earnings. <clears throat> no increases to customers. Remember that line for later. No increases to customers. For more information on the program and a list of participating venues, visit roadagain.live. So really quick, one of the things I want to show you on screen here is the list of participating venues. Now keep in mind, these are Live Nation venues. This is specifically a Live Nation thing. These are venues. I don't even know this. The Van Buren, where is that? Is is that the is that a new name for one of uh, Phoenix's arenas? Because I don't I don't recognize that name. Venues that Live Nation actually owns, not that they just promote at or anything. They own these venues, and there's some uh, decent sized ones on here, man. Right away, the Van Buren in Phoenix, Arizona. That was a stop that we did on the Electric Cowboy tour. That's like 2,200 capacity, 2,200, like good size venue. And bands that are playing venues that size, I mean, that's that's huge that they're not going to get a merch cut taken away. I have a feeling just looking at this list, that's probably one of the biggest venues that's going to be on here. You know, the Fillmore in Minneapolis. I'd be curious to see if the Fillmore in Denver is in here because that's a bigger venue. Uh, oh, here's Colorado. So they got the Summit. The Marquee and the Moon Room. So the Fillmore Denver is not on this list, which is a Live Nation venue. But that place is about 3,800 capacity. So a lot of these venues on here are definitely, like they said, in those club levels. Um, one of the things to keep in mind, too, is that a lot of these venues are an artist sells venue. What that means is when it comes to merchandise, there is either a artist sell or a venue sell. An artist sell means that the artist themselves or their merchandise manager on the road is setting up, displaying, inventorying, doing all of the merch themselves. A venue sell is when a band or the merchandise manager is counting in with the venue and then that venue takes everything and they set up and display and sell everything all night and then at the end you count out with them. So that's been the biggest argument with merchandise fees for me. Like I did merchandise for years and I've always believed that if it's an artist sell where a band or their merchandise manager is having to sell everything themselves, there should be no fee at all. The venue has done nothing at all other than provide the space and that's always been an argument from the venues is that we're providing you space for you to sell your merch so you owe us something for that because we could have put something else in that space like a bar or something like that but i firmly believe if a band is selling it themselves or the merchandise manager is there should never be a fee but i do on the other hand believe 
I know not a lot of bands would agree with me, but I do believe if, if it's a venue sell where the venue is selling everything all night for you, you should be paying a fee to them because those people that worked all day need to get paid. And what better way than to just tack on a merch fee? I mean, you know, I've seen bands on Twitter and stuff say like, like arena sized bands are like, this is so unfair that, uh, that we're getting merch fees taken away from our stuff. I was like, yeah, but what, what you're not telling your fans is that your merchandise manager is counting in merchandise with the venue. And then the venue in an arena is, is a, like 20 people minimum because they're setting up four or five different displays on different levels of that arena. They're doing everything. They're displaying everything. They're selling everything. They're doing inventory control. Like in a situation like that, venues should get paid for doing your merchandise. They have provided a service. They have worked for you and you need to pay them. So if anybody's ever confused or curious on my stance on merch fees, if a venue does nothing and a band does everything themselves, they should never pay a fee ever. But if the venue does all the selling and all that stuff, then a fee should be involved. But as I said in the beginning, Live Nation, a giant powerhouse monopoly in the music industry, first thing in my brain is what's the catch? Live Nation is not doing this out of the goodness of their own hearts. Yes, bands have been very vocal about merch fees lately and they needed to do something. They needed to do something to get them out of all the negative press. And this seems like it has. Cause I saw some bands online celebrating this where I'm just like, you need to, this isn't the W you think it is. You need to hold off. One of the biggest ones here that I saw, uh, one of the more outspoken people too about merch fees and stuff like that. And we've talked about it on the channel. Uh, Andy from Monuments. You might also know him from doing Termina with Nick Nocturnal. Uh, Andy posted uh, yesterday, or no, sorry, two days ago, three days ago, something like that, September 25th. He said, quote, today is the first day that at Live Nation has halted merch cuts for smaller venues. It's real. We will not be paying out today. Huge W. Great job, everyone. Keep making noise until it's the standard everywhere. My issue with that statement, again, is I feel like bands are just falling into exactly what Live Nation wanted. You didn't beat Live Nation. You're never going to beat Live Nation. They fucking own you. If you're in a band, they always will. You're never going to win. So this to me, seeing all these bands celebrating like crazy, there may be some immediate impacts that you see. Yes, not paying a merch fee, maybe getting a little extra money, like awesome. But there are going to be repercussions from this. Um, there was a lot of people that posted on here, like congratulations, a lot of verified accounts, a lot of other bands that were talking about how huge uh, this is. I actually responded just to be funny with Andy. You can see it right here. I said, oh, you poor naive soul. And to be fair, Andy responded and he said, I already have my reservations that there will be a catch. However, we didn't pay last night and Live Nation gave us $1,200 back. Cash is still in our hands. So it is a win for now, at least. 100% I agree with that statement. That's a win. Their band got an extra $1,200, but $1,200 isn't $1,500. So now I'm wondering, I'm like, where's the missing $300? So one of the things I wanted to talk about is that one of my friends who is a promoter, who does work with Live Nation, told me that that $1,500 stipend, there are going to be situations where it is like versus a guarantee. So basically, and this is, this is hearsay, this is speculation, this came from somebody else, this is not on paper from Live Nation, so I do have to throw that out there just so nobody quotes me. But this person did tell me that the $1,500 in most situations is going to be versus a guarantee. So basically what that means is that bands are guaranteed up to $1,500 mm. depending on what they're already getting guaranteed for the show. It's going to be versus a lot of door deals. So like th the way that it looks is that each band can possibly make a minimum of, you know, $1,500 uh -uh. a night or up to $1,500 a night, like somebody just said in chat. But it's not on top of what they're already getting paid. If a band has a guarantee of like, let's say $1,500 already, I don't believe they're going to give them an extra $1,500. Like, I don't think that's happening. If it does happen and any bands out there like do receive that money after getting a big guarantee already, let me know because I'd be very curious. The other thing to keep in mind off of that is um, that's going to be a huge tax write-off for Live Nation. That's like they're basically just g giving money away to bands that's not part of the contract or the deal. Massive tax write-off for Live Nation. Now, I'm not an attorney. I'm not a tax attorney. I'm not a lawyer or anything like that. So I don't know exactly how that's going to work. But if you're a business and you're handing out money, you're, you're going to get a write-off for that. That's So that's that's part of that. Isano and Chat just said, unless matters, the paying so. party is one of Willie Nelson's charity funds. They didn't stipulate that in that announcement though. In the announcement, it said that all of this money is coming from Live Nation's already existing earnings. That was worded by them specifically. So if one of Willie Nelson's charities is involved. So does that only matter for that, for those venues that they own? They did not say that. Here's an interesting tweet. And this is one of the things I wanted to bring up. Live Nation just officially launched a campaign to knock out all of their independent competitors under the guise of helping and supporting the smaller touring industry. That is a big part of this that nobody is thinking about. Live Nation just launched a genius PR campaign for this. I mean, they're getting nothing but good press from this. And this is going to knock out their competitors. It, that's what's going to happen. 
because Live Nation is like, oh, we're going to pay bands more. Oh, we're not going to charge a merch fee at clubs. Well, now all these bands are going to want to pay at Live Nation. They're going to want to play at Live Nation venues and not the independently owned ones. So yeah, like that's 100% a thing. Like independent venues are sweating about this because they're going to suffer. It's going to happen. Dragon's Den 96 just brought up an excellent question in the chat. Do you think this is a scheme to buy out the indie venues? I don't know if it's a scheme. I wouldn't go as far as saying the word scheme, but Live Nation has been known to do this. They buy out these independent venues, you know, enough where they own over 51%, but then they let these venues still operate under their name. So they don't look like they're Live Nation owned. That's a fucking thing. That is a thing. So well, in Chicago, for example, one of my really good friends is a promoter in Chicago. Actually Live and he Nation. has told me that over the pandemic, Live Nation swooped in and bought the majority stake in a lot of independent venues. But they've stayed behind the scenes with their name out of it. So they don't want to make it look like these independent venues have become Live Nation venues. They let them operate as a venue, but they own the majority, so they're still making money from it. So let's say a band that doesn't like Live Nation is booking a tour and they tell their booking agent, no, don't book us at the House of Blues in Chicago. Book us at this indie venue. That indie venue could still possibly be majority owned by Live Nation. Eddie Trunk says, great move here by Live Nation. And then Craig, um, yeah, Craig Reynolds said, okay, we did Live Nation at Twitch. Give me my 70-30 back. <laughs> this is the problem though. Every single one of these bands played exactly into Live Nation's hands. They're writing it off as a giant W. Bands right now are thinking, we did it. We beat Live Nation. We were so vocal about it that they caved and they are doing all of this for us. Again, I don't know the specifics yet, we're still doing digging. Live Nation is a billion dollar monopoly, dude. They are not doing this out of the goodness of their own hearts. Ella Nuvian in chat just said, the bands are focusing on the now. They're not thinking about what comes after. That is a fantastic point as well. And that is a good segue into what I wanted to talk about. Another one of my friends that I talked to that is a Live Nation employee told me that they would not be surprised. Now this is, again, just for, I guess, like legal reasons and don't quote me on this. Um, this is just speculation from what a Live Nation employee told me. I would not be surprised to start seeing um, like an extra couple dollar fee on Ticketmaster to make up for some of the money they're losing from merch sales. Now, I don't know whether or not that's for sure gonna happen or not, but I started thinking about it. I started thinking about it and I was like, mm, how much money would they make up from this? Let's say a band is playing at a 1000 capacity venue and they're doing $10 a head in merchandise. And that is the most important number for merchandise, just so everybody knows, is your dollar per head amount, not the gross amount. Cause if you're playing at a 1000 capacity venue and you do a thousand dollars in merch, eh, four figures looks pretty good but that's $1 per head. That is the big number that all merchandise managers and accountants look at at shows is the dollar per head. So we're gonna, I, I just wanna stress the importance of that. So if a band is playing at a 1000 capacity venue and they do $10,000 in merchandise that night, that means they did $10 per head. That means for every body that was in that room that paid for a ticket and went to the show, on average, each person spent $10 in merchandise. That's a good number. $10 a head is a decent number for nowadays standards, for sure. Now, most Live Nation venues, have been charging 20%. 20% merchandise fee, um, you know, at, off the adjusted gross, because you got to take out local taxes and credit card fees and stuff like that. But let's just, for the sake of math, let's just say 20% of $10,000 is $2,000. So that's an extra $2,000 that the band is not going to get taken from them for doing merchandise with this program. That's it's pretty awesome, you know? $2,000 gets a band way further on the road. It allows them to pay for gas, maybe a hotel room, their crew, whatnot. That's awesome. Let's just say a new $3 on the road again fee gets added to all-in pricing for Ticketmaster. So let's say starting you know now, an extra $3 gets added onto every ticket you're gonna buy. That means at that 1,000 capacity venue, Live Nation, if they're adding a $3 fee onto every ticket, is now gonna make $3,000 in additional income that they wouldn't before. That's more than if they were charging a merchandise fee. So if you look at it, yeah, that's great that the bands are getting that extra $2,000 that Live Nation would have normally taken from them. But if that happens, that means Live Nation is going to be passing on all of these costs to the fans and they're actually going to end up making more money than they would have if they just continued charging merch. Yeah, I mean, we, we don't know any of this yet, but I mean, how many times has artists fought Ticketmaster over all these insane added on fees and everything? I mean, this is just... This is a disgustingly broken system that needed to be fixed long ago. Merchandise fees to bands. These are the little things with this program that were sticking out to me that I'm like, where's the catch? Little things like this. 
Dragon's Den 96 just said, to be fair, I'd spend $3 extra to make sure the band gets paid properly. Fair enough. I, you know what? I think I would too. I'd pay that extra $3 just to make sure that bands were getting 100% of their merch fees. But here's the problem. Like I just said, Live Nation is going to make more money off of you anyways. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, this is a lose-lose for everybody and a win-win for, for Live Nation, in my opinion, right now. Just looking at this where we're at right now. Yeah, as Frost just said in chat again, like they, they have to recoup this money from somewhere. Live Nation is not a business that's going to be doing things out of the goodness of their own heart that's going to benefit the consumers and the, and the bands. It's just not. They're a business. They're a billion-dollar yeah, business. The they, they're going to make money somehow. So I've talked to some of my friends that are production managers at some of these Live Nation venues that are on this list. Some of them were places we just went to uh, with Electric Callboy. And according to them, this has already become kind of a nightmare situation because um, they did tell me that, yes, they are cutting additional checks to bands each night. So they are paying out bands more, like the program said that they are going to. Um, but a lot of Live Nation venues now are cashless, which means they're exactly how it sounds. They're not giving out cash for anything anymore. Um, so now production managers at these venues have to do tons more paperwork every night and um, cut additional checks and all this other stuff. Or if they do cash, they have to get those advances a week ahead of time and stuff like that. So while the program at face value does look good, it's already putting a lot more work on Live Nation employees at the venues. Don't care. But I also will say. Don't care. Live honestly. Nation as a company does not have a good reputation. Even in my opinion, it's pretty much f Live Nation. But I will say there are some wonderful people that actually work at Live Nation at the promoter and venue level. Like some of the people that I worked with on this last tour were absolutely incredible. Our promoter for the tour was absolutely incredible. I mean, most of the, the problems from Live Nation are at the corporate level. So a lot of the stuff that's going on here actually just seems like a, a, a lot more work for the, the actual staff at the venues than anything. Now, another one of my friends at a Live Nation venue did say um, from an internal memo that they got from Live Nation, they are continuing no merch fees at their venue through 2024. But the On the Road Again program that includes the extra payouts for bands for road expenses, that ends in three months. Three months and it'll be done completely. So yeah, this is definitely a temporary situation to get people to shut up, to get pe to get bands on Live Nation's side to be like, they care about us, they're trying. I, listen, I'm just going to I'm just gonna be really blunt here. If there's any band members out here that, that see this, uh, I would like to just say, um, Live Nation does not give a f about you. They give a f about their bottom line. That's it. Live Nation is trying to make money. Now, that's not to say that there aren't Live Nation uh, employees out there that, that don't care. There probably are some promoters and venue people out there that, that absolutely do care about the bands they work with. I can tell you right now, the promoter that we had on, on the Electric Callboy Tour in North America was absolutely fantastic and a wonderful human being that did a lot for us that they did not need to do. They care. But Live Nation is a corporate company. They don't give a f man. Are you kidding? All of the things that we've talked about today are probably true. This is... A scheme to put independent venues out of business. This is good PR to get people to shut up about how much Live Nation is f***ing over bands. Now, let's talk about the bands really quick. The last thing I want to talk about this no merch fee thing with the bands. Um, bands, for a while now, have been defending their merchandise prices. Because we've seen t-shirt prices go up astronomically at concerts. Um, I've seen like $40 t-shirts at shows recently. $40, $45. Hell, I went to a show recently where t-shirts were $55. Bands have been defending that by saying, well, because the venue charges us a merch fee, we have to sell our stuff for more so that we can make up for that lost income. Now that these certain Live Nation venues aren't charging merchandise fees, now is the time for these bands to put their fucking money where their mouth is. Because yeah, not gonna if bands don't bring down their prices, that tells you right there that the bands were full of shit too. Now... On the flip side of that, I will say I think fans would be happy to know that 100% of their money was going to the band and they'd probably happily pay $40 for a t-shirt. I would, honestly. If I went and saw a band, if I knew they were getting 100% of that money, I'd probably pay $40 for a t-shirt. Wow. When Sabaton did their small venue tour in Sweden, they sold their merch for very cheap. A t-shirt was $15 and a hoodie $25 or at least at the venue I was at. Wow. Another reason why Sabaton is awesome, if that's true. I want to support the band. But, but Sabaton is awesome. For all the bands out there that have been using the defensive merchandise fees for why their merch is so expensive, well, we'd love to sell it for less, but we can't because there's fees. What are you going to do now? I mean, spotlight's on the bands right now, other than Live Nation. Like, are we going to get lower merch prices or uh, no? My, my guess would be no. Because like I said, people are already used to buying t-shirts for a certain price and now there's going to be no fees, so the bands are going to make more. But like I said, I think fans would be okay with that knowing that 100% of their money is going to the band. Temporarily right now, Bands are definitely going to be getting more money, which is great. That is a good thing. But 
in the long run, what is this going to do? What is this going to do to consumers? What is this going to do to independent venues that aren't owned by Live, Live Nation? Oh, 105 pounds for baby metal shirt. <laughs> yeah. Oh, did baby metal play with Sabaton? Holy crap. We got to look that up. Hold on. Sorry. Can't miss this. Oh yeah, the, the singer from yeah, collaboration with Baby Metal. Oh, here we go. I'm just going to get blocked by Facebook, so never mind. Like we already talked about, this on-the-road program itself is only going until the end of 2023, unless they extend it. As another merchandise manager friend of mine said that we brought up earlier, this is just a temporary fix to get people to shut up for a while, and that's about it. Cookies! But yeah, anyways, I guess that's a good place to wrap this up. Uh, we're going to keep our eyes on this. I am very curious to keep my eye on this and see what actually happens, um, whether they continue this program or to see what happens, and it's just, this is interesting. Because right now, Live Nation looks like they have the giant W on their chest, like they just changed the game. But I still think that there's some some weird stuff. There's some weird stuff afoot here, and I don't know what it is, but we're going to figure it out. But until next time, thank you to everybody that's on Twitch right now. Anybody on YouTube, if you'd like to join us on Twitch later, uh, my link is twitch.tv slash tank the tech. We stream three days a week, and we talk music stuff and do reactions, so you're more than welcome to join us. And if you'd like to follow me on social media, my handle on most everything is at tank the tech. But until next time... Wherever you are in the world, be safe, be kind. Right, well, awesome. I think we sort of learned something. Um, but thank you, Jim Lil, and I can't wait for that mic preamp video. And aside from that, I will...